Thank you, Ashley. Thanks for uh, having me on for the podcast. Um, this is brand new to me, so uh, uh, hang hang tough with me. <laughs> this is uh, uh, I'm scared to death, actually. <laughs> Shouldn't be, but uh, yeah, it's all this computer savvy stuff. I'm not really right into it, but uh, I'm here today to uh, do this webinar and just kind of speak um, on behalf of of uh, you know the stock dogs. Um, and then my phone will come on. Good. Um, okay. So now, uh, my first question that I kind of put, you know, to everybody, just to kind of get started. Uh, well, I guess first of all, it's my introduction myself. Uh, <laughs> it's Ken McKenzie. Uh, I was born and raised in Drayton Valley, Alberta. Uh, I was raised on a cow calf operation. Uh, my dad had all different types of cattle over the years, number of years. Uh, we AI'd number of cattle, um, you know, different breeds uh, and stuff. Um, and uh, we always had dogs. We always had uh, some type of dog. Predominantly what we had was blue healers. Uh, but as kind of life kind of went on, uh, I ended up going to college, uh, got introduced to the Board of Coley, uh, went to my first clinic of um, of Elvin Cops, shoot, over 30 years ago. And uh, ever since then, I had a Board of Coley. Uh, I enjoyed working with the dogs uh, because of the uh, interaction between the dog and myself and the cattle. Um, I never had sheep up to that point. But as I realized that the dogs are easier and quicker to train on sheep and then moving them to cattle, and uh, I kind of went that direction. With that, though, I also progressed into some sheep dog trials. Um, for the learning environment, for me, is predominantly why I did that. Um, but, uh, man, I had... Uh, I had a lot of, I had a lot of learning curves, you know, um, and maybe something that, you know, I'll kind of start off with, uh, you know, why own a working stock dog for your sheep operation? Uh, maybe that's jumping it again. I got a small flock of sheep also. I didn't, didn't say I got about 60 ewes right now. Um, and also just for enjoyment for myself over the years, I was into cutting horses and cow horses. I didn't do a lot of it, but I took one one horse to a three-year-old uh, cutting faturity to the three, four, five, six, and seven-year-old cuttings. I enjoy the interaction between, you know, the cattle or the sheep and the dog. It's kind of a three-way triangle. Um, if one isn't strong enough, um, you know, it just doesn't work. Uh, there has to be a real feel between a three-way kind of a street. So just touching in on why I own a working stock dog to work your sheep operation. Well, simply put, a well-trained dog can do the work of five to ten people. makes your life a lot easier than having the whole family out there having to bring your flock in and still can't get the job done. Some of the other reasons why is when the sheep get out into a field of alfalfa and yet they've been on hay for the for the winter months, it can be impossible to bring your sheep back into the area where you wanted to house them. Those are some of the basic reasons, but the amount of work that these dogs can do, if you enjoy working with them, can be very fulfilling, um, probably to say the least. Um, if you don't enjoy working with a dog or like that interaction between an animal like that, it's probably not the best for you. Um, if you're too busy, you have no time to train or no time to uh, put a little bit of time you know, into training the dog, 
it can probably be more of a menace than help. Um, but if you enjoy it, it uh, it's very fulfilling. Um, uh, I mean, I, I just know myself, I could never go back to not having a decent dog to help me do the work. Um, way too labor intensive, way too frustrating. Um, so those are the reasons why I would own a working stock dog for my sheep operation. Uh, what kind of working dog would you need or want? You know, well, it depends on the type of jobs that you have or could you use your dog for. For me, there's some gathering, you know, from bigger areas, bigger fields, bigger paddocks. There's sorting, you know, in the pens or out in the field. Driving, driving stock down a, a roadway to enter into another field, you know, miles down the road. Pen work for just basically sorting sheep or putting them into races or alleyways or for cattle predominantly for me, it was just bringing them in to a holding area where I could bring in smaller groups, you know, 10 or 15 to put down a bigger alleyway down into a sheep area. Well, it's no different when you're working with sheep. You know, you bring in the bigger group, a big enough group that you're not crowding too much or causing, you know, a problem there. And then breaking them down into smaller groups or sorting them, you know, from ewes and lambs before you vaccinate or what have you. For myself here at home, I'm not set up, you know, for a big sheep operation. I'm set up more for uh, a cattle setup. But after having, you know, 60 ewes now, it's, there's just no way I can do it unless I have a decent type of a setup. Um, that means just having some smaller areas, a crowding tub, a sorting, you know, a sorting gate or something, some way of doing that uh, to make your life a lot simpler. I, I mean, you really do need some infrastructure that way, uh, no matter what. But the dogs can do so much of this work to make it easier. Like I said, if a person is willing and takes the time to uh, train on your dog to get them to do some of these jobs comfortably. Okay, moving down here. Where can I keep my dog? For myself, I keep my dogs in kennels. Um, if you have any number of dogs at all, it's very difficult to let all the dogs just run amok, you know, around the house yard. I live close to a highway. So in the past, it's just very scary to have dogs out loose for your livestock sake. and people driving in the yard, you know, and accidentally running over, you know, somebody's dog. Not, I've heard the stories. I haven't had one of my own dogs yet ran over, but uh, it's a possibility. So just taking and thinking about where it would be the safest for your dog, if you plan on putting all this time and effort into your stock dog, uh, it's, it's well worth having an area that's safe for them, safe in an area um, where they can't get hung up. Um, I've had that happen accidentally. Um, it's it's just important to have an area where if you have them tied up, that there's a swivel on a chain. They can't jump over top of a fence or something, get hung up on the chain. Uh, they get, can't get tangled, you know. Um, so if you're tied to a dog house or if you have your dog in your house and he's always with you, I mean, that's 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 great. That's perfect. If I could have my choice, I'd have my dogs with me all the time. But when you have a big um, assortment of dogs um, and pups, it's too easy for those little guys to get out 
or get into an, into some mischief and some trouble. And then the next thing you know, you've lost your dog. Um, you know, pups are ranging, I don't know, let's say from $500 to $10,000. I don't know, but these dogs are worth something to you. You put the time into house training them or, uh, just enjoying them, watching them grow up and start to develop to want to work and you lose your dog. So it, it is very important to find out or think about how you're going to attend to this dog when you're not around. Um, or if he's always with you, that's, that's all, you know, honestly, probably the best. I don't tie to dog houses. I keep my dogs in kennels. They're basically a eight by 10 kennel um, dog house with some, dry you know uh, hay in in the, in the dog houses and as long as they have a dry warm spot and uh, and you let them out morning and night for a good run um that's sufficient as long as you're putting time into it i need to spend more time with it over this last year or two i've kind of faltered there but it is really important to have a, a place where you can keep your dog safe uh, another thing that I wanted to touch on was that they're not watching stock work from their pen area. So, for instance, I don't put my dog kennel right beside my sheep pen where my lambs are playing and my sheep are always moving in and through a gateway. It's um, It just wears my border coli right out, uh, creates some bad habits because they're still working within their confined space. And uh, I like to keep an area where I've kind of got it behind some uh, bush lines and trees. Uh, it's quiet, uh, and uh, that's kind of where I like to house my dogs. Um, but like I said, more time you can spend with your dog, the better. If he could be with me every second of the day, I don't think it can be a bad thing. As long as your dog has some manners, he's doing what you want within your space. Um, I think it's great. Move on here again. Where can you start training your dog on sheep? If you decided you just... Actually, I'm going to back up one more step here. What type of dog? Because I never really talked about it. I talked about blue healers when I was a kid, and they were a tough little dog. The healers that we had really did the job that we wanted. But when I got exposed to the Border Coley, I realized how many different types of jobs they could do. And probably the biggest difference between the healer and the border coley was that the livestock. They could read livestock so much better than a blue healer because they could work at a little farther distance. Um, and they didn't have to be biting all the time. It was about controlling the herd by being in a certain position and a distance off the stock and also controlling the whole group, not just focusing in on one or two of the animals, but actually focusing on the whole group uh, of herd of cattle as you're working them, reading the leading livestock, the livestock that we're trying to you know, get away, the kind that was searching for a hole to sneak away and go where I didn't want them to go. And... Uh, that's where the border coolies, I really saw them shine in that area. There's other breeds that can do the job. I predominantly went with the border coli because there's a big gene pool. The gene pool is much larger. I can find a lot of good border coolies in Alberta compared to a lot of good Kelpies, a lot of good Australian Shepherds, a lot of good... New Zealand heading dogs. Um, one dog that I think that I would consider if I had a big flock of sheep is the Huntaway. I was in New Zealand as a kid. I was 12 years old. We stayed there six months on the South Island on a little town named Wyndham. And we got exposed to really what amazing, amazing sheep and, you know, dog work. They had New Zealand head and dogs, but they also had a Huntaway, and the Huntaway is a big tan black dog that barks. And there's a place for those dogs in bigger groups and bigger mobs. 
uh, inside pen for pen work. Um, I've never trained one, but I know just I thought I'd better touch on it. If I was ever working big flocks of sheep, I would get me one of those huntaways for sure. But anyways, going back to the the border coles, the reason I, I still own them and enjoy them and train them because they do have everything that I want in a dog to be able to help me get the job done. I like to be able to go with my dog, whether I'm on quad, on foot, on horseback, and get the job done without me doing most of the work. For me, I need the dog to pull his weight. Otherwise, it's not something that I enjoy. It's not something that I'm going to have around. They have to get the job done. And they have to be bold enough. They have to be tough enough. But they have to have the brains to be able to help me realize, you know, realize that I'm doing this job and please help me figure it out. Help me get these animals into this pen, into this area. Help me sort them, you know. Help me watch that gate. Help me hold those sheep away from the feeder as I feed them. Help me gather this field. Help me bring the sheep in that just broke out. They have to help me get the job done. I mean, just having a pet at my feet isn't something that I enjoy. I really enjoy my dogs doing work, and they feel good about themselves at the end of the day, and so do I. So that's why another reason why I own them. Uh, let's see. I'm going to touch on. Where can I start training my dog? So let's say I bought myself a Border Collie pup and I decided, you know, okay, I'm going to train them. I need some sheep. Okay. The type of sheep that I would recommend getting is some dog broke sheep. Sheep that are not afraid of humans because I want to be close to the sheep. I'm trying to use the dog's instinct to my advantage. If the dog wants the sheep and I stay close to the sheep, I can usually control the situation and get control of my dog without having a cord on the dog, without having someone help me. Um, so that's really important. The other thing is having an area where you can work. For me, I would prefer anybody that's new getting into it to work in an area that's small enough so that you can actually get close to the sheep. You can't get close to your sheep. You can't control your dog. I use body pressure. Body pressure and the dog yields my body pressure to position my dog where I want. Kind of like, I would say a goalie, you know, playing hockey. I'm blocking. I'm blocking, you know, the puck from coming to me. I'm bumping the puck away from me. So that would be kind of not a good analogy, sorry. But it's basically, I'm blocking, kind of like the Great Wall of China is kind of what I said in the past on. I pretend like if the sheep are the center of the clock, the center of the universe, my dog wants those sheep. I'm going to step off to one side, put up this barrier like a Great Wall of China, and portray to the dog that you can't come my direction and encourage the dog to move away from me. And as the dog moves away from me, I just follow the dog around the sheep because the dog wants to circle and the border collie wants to naturally want to get around the stock. I will just fall in on his hip and now I'm going a direction. Um, that's maybe more the like kind of farther ahead than what I should be starting at. But basically, I, I want to be able to work in a smaller area. I want to be able to control my dog and have a, a shot at actually getting control of my dog and try to encourage my dog in a nice, soft, easy way, if possible. Um, I'm always starting at level one and work my way to level 10. And I'm always trying to be understanding and fair i'm trying to realize where the pup is if the pup's first day is in the pen 
he can get away with murder the first day. It's okay. But every day I try to shape and mold my dogs to be able to get a little bit more, get a little bit more each day. I feel like I want to be able to progress on a foundation, wherever, whatever that is, and start small and just keep chipping away at little pieces. And um, man, it can happen really fast with a pup. Some of the instincts that you're working with, this stuff can happen within minutes to two or three sessions. And you're just, the progress out of 100%, you could be up 30% in two days like it's just amazing you got a dog that never saw the sheep to all of a sudden he's circling left right and he's stopping and you can call him off in in two sessions it's amazing that instinct having good quality breeding is important pick from from parents that want to work pick from people that you can trust you know that you like the way they work their dogs or or you know something along that line I think I think it's just really important to pick pick a dog that you enjoy that you like like if you're picking a pup pick a pup that kind of suits your nature as long as they come from working parents as long as you treat them like they're the best in the world more than likely they're going to be and if they don't you start over again you try again if you're looking for a working stock dog and you're working with a pup um if you're looking at buying a dog, go and look at the dog. See see what he can do. Um, if you feel like you're impressed and you like what you see on the stock that, that they're working and it's along the lines of what you're doing with your dog or plan to do with your dog, uh, and go for it. Take a shot in the dark and uh, ask around and see if, if that's something that really, you know, from other people that you know, that would suit you. And there's two questions that came through in the chat box. Um, the yes. first one is when going to pick out a new pup, what things are you looking for? Okay. The kind of things I'm looking for in a pup is the parents first. I want to look at the breeding because I know certain bloodlines that I like. But first and foremost, probably is to go and look at the parents, watch them work like I just previously said here, but um, okay. And the that, second, that's ultimately the most important. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I didn't mean to cut you off um, if you weren't finished. I was just going to say the second question is what age do you start your pups? Oh, that one, I hate that one. <laughs> because uh, I hate, honestly, it's better to wait but better to wait when they're 10 months, a year old. It is better, maybe, but not necessarily. And I just hate telling people because I'll start my pups when they want to work. If they're wanting to work, I'm going to start, you know, influencing them a little bit, letting them see what they're going to be like. But, but you've got to be so careful that you don't put too much pressure on him and turn your pup off before he's ever started. Kind of like a little pilot light is flickering. And you think, oh, wow, man, that little man, if I just blow on that and add a little, turn that valve a little bit more, it'll get bigger and brighter. And the more you ask and the more you push, the smaller that light gets. Pretty soon the light goes out. And the pup doesn't want to work anymore because you put too much pressure on them. So what age do you start them? I start them as early as what they want to work at the ability that they can handle. If their legs are short and their bellies are fat, they're just little fat little pups. I cannot expect very much. I'm realistic about how much you can expect. So when they're at that age, it's not fair. When they're a year, year and a half old, maturity, like, as far as mature in a physical sense, they're already big enough. They're capable enough. They're big enough to outrun a sheep. When they're little pups, they can't catch a sheep. 
they're too small. But if there's some really dog broke ewes and they're quiet and they don't want to run and the pup can get around, I think that's okay. But don't let the pup get hurt. The, the most important thing is don't let the pup get run over. Don't let them get beat up. Don't. That's on on the sheep putting pressure on your dog, but also you putting pressure on your dog. Don't 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 put that pressure on that pup. Just let them kind of be. But I like to sneak it in there. I like to be in the right position at the right place at the right time to influence the things that I want. And so for me to say that, you know, I can start the dogs earlier. Or but to recommend someone to go and do that, man, uh, it. Man, it could it could really burn you, and you could just ruin a pup too easy, you know. I I don't know what else to say about that. It's just a really a feel thing, um, but it is better to start them as they're as they're a little bit older, and when they're really their desire and their keenness is there. Meaning, when I walk out to the sheep pen with my young dog, let's say he's six months old, I haven't had him on the sheep yet, and I walk out to the, I'm going to have a cord and collar on him. I'm not going to let the pup just run off right off the bat. I'm just going to walk out there with the dog on a leash and see if he kind of is pulling on the leash and wants to work. If he does, and I'm in somewhat of a good position, I'm probably going to let the pup go. I'm on really good dog broke sheep. I'm on really quiet sheep. I'm in a small enough area that I can run the little pup down and jump on the, grab the cord, you know, and drag him away and protect him for another day if I need be. Um, so I don't know if I'm getting too deep into that or not, or too much on a tangent, but does that answer the question? Yes, I believe that answered that question. And I actually have one more that just came through and it says, do bottle lambs make a good dog broke training sheep since they tend to be used to people in quieter? They can be, but they might not respect the dog. And if the dog comes around the sheet and he walks onto the sheet, because it's a three-way triangle, the dog, the sheep, and the handler. And they all have to be interconnected. They all have to have a strong bond. I have to have, as a handler, be strong enough in my ability to work sheep. Otherwise, if, if I'm really poor at handling the dog, I really won't be able to train the dog and the dog will overtake everything and or the sheep will overtake the dog. You know, for instance, the little pup, if he pup gets around the sheep and then the bottle lambs look at him and the bottle lamb turns around and just chases the dog, the little pup off. Well, he's probably not much of a dog then, but but even then it's I want something that already sees a dog, knows and respects the dog and moves away from the dog. That's what builds the confidence in your pup. So bottle lambs are great because they stay with you. It's great because they'll probably hopefully stay together if you had three of them. Um, but it's really the dog doing the work. So if the dog gets around the bottle lambs and it looks like he's controlling all the bottle lambs, I, I think it probably would work. But if the pup gets around the sheep, the bottle lambs, and the lambs look at him, and then they start bunting them and, and not wanting to move, and then they split up and break off into three different directions, you're not, it's not very productive. So I like to use some sheep that I know we're going to be good with, with pups, because I've already had them on pups before, you know, at one point or, or another. Or if there's one bad one in there, I'll just pull that you out, and I'll just put a nice, quiet, you know well broke you in with it just to build my dog's confidence and get my pup so that it wants to get around the sheep and cover both directions and feel comfortable controlling those three or four sheep that I'm working. So bottle lamps, eh, I don't know, maybe, but maybe not. I, I don't know. It just depends. I, I mean, I might be able to, but you know, working with them because of the experience, but someone new, it, it, it's maybe not a bad thing. I mean, you could have worse. You could have ones that are really like hurting a dog or just running off wild. So that way is probably better. But, um, and I'm not sure if I'm really answering the questions quite right, but 
that was my best shot at it. No, that was great. I've got one more question that we'll answer. That I'll let you know now, and then I'll let you continue with the presentation, and then we can have more questions come later. Uh, so this last okay. question was: What do you see as the most common mistakes people will make when starting a working dog? Hmm. The most common mistakes. I see people making when they're starting their dog. Possibly just before you even go to stock. I would probably say that would probably be the most important because I would think if a dog had a little bit of basic obedience and respect for the handler, and if the dog was bred right and wanted to work, I think it would work out better that way. So I'd probably pick. I probably pick basic obedience. And mm, just to touch on that, I don't spend a lot of time putting obedience on my working stock dogs. And I was told that a long time ago. Um, I remember, I'm sure uh, Alvin Cobb, one of, one of the guys that I learned a lot from. This is one of the first things that he said, you know, just don't put a lot of obedience, but you know, don't overdo it because what happens is the dog focuses more on you and your actions and and looking for cues in your face or your hand gestures or uh, or something, you know, or wants to look at you because you're the one that's directing the questions to them too much. And then when you go to sheep and you start, I mean, usually a good dog won't do that, but it, it does happen. So I don't like to over put too much obedience on my pups either. Just enough so the pup will come to his name. Just enough so the dog has an idea how to lie down or stand. And that's it. I don't drill on it. I don't work on it until they're starting to work stock. And as they're working stock more, I put more obedience on them. So as I put even more working training on the livestock, then I go back and put more obedience on or can expect more. But I don't want my dog looking at me. I want him looking at the sheep uh, as possible. So I don't know. See it there again. I I don't know if I answered the question quite right or not. I think that was great, and I know I said that would be the last one, and then I'd let you continue with your presentation. But I will have one more um, before you continue on, and it's my bottle lamb wanted to play, and it confused my dog. Now to my question: How many sheep should you have in a pen when training? As many as the, I mean, it's to make it easy for you to get around the sheep, like for, for me, I want to be able to walk around my sheep comfortably without struggling. I mean, when I was younger, man, I could get around 20 sheep pretty easy. Now, uh, I think four is probably five sheep is enough for me to get around with a young pup because I want to try and stay in a good position to influence my pup. And if I have way too many sheep, I can't help. Now, it depends on what I'm working on. If I'm just trying to build the pup's confidence and I got 15 or 20 ewes in a, in a bigger area and they're not wanting to run off and the pup seems to be controlling them, I guess I'm not really hurting much. But if this young dog is full of energy and excitement and maybe has some bad intentions, Probably not the smartest thing to do is to let my pup go on 15 or 20 sheep and let him savage like a bunch of sheep before I finally get a hold of them. So I'm trying to I'm trying to be fair to my livestock, but I'm trying to be fair to my training so that hopefully that I can progress. So I always start small and work big. Always. So I try and work on a group that I think is going to build my dog's confidence. Use some dog broke sheep allow my dog to get around and build his confidence about moving livestock without necessarily, I mean, I want my dogs to bite. I'm not the type that says don't bite, but there's a place where and time where you slowly have to start saying, okay, you know, was that really necessary to be that rough to get the job done? Like all we had to do is move the sheep from here to here and, you had to do all that just to get that done. I kind of want to do it in a respectful manner, but it all has to do with 
with stockmanship, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit on the end. Uh, Cause I think that's probably the, one of the most important pieces, you know, to even starting to train. Otherwise it's kind of like one old fella used to say, like giving a monkey a machine gun. Uh, it can be dangerous. You know, if you get a really good quality dog that wants to do his job and then he gets in there and really causes havoc on your livestock and cause a lot of damage, it's um, it's not good. It's not good for a lot of parties. And a lot of times it's the dog that pays the price. You know, the guy says, oh, the dog's way too this, and the next thing you know, he's gone. And, and it's not fair. Uh, I always like to, I like to be fair to my livestock. I like to be fair to my dogs. And I like to be fair to, you know, my program. Like, is it working or not? Right? And there again, I don't know if I answered it right or not. I hope that helped. So I guess if uh, that's it, I'll uh, continue on to uh, the importance of stockmanship. Ashley, did you uh, did that answer that question or not? I believe so, yes. So you're good to continue on. Okay. So just talking about stockmanship, because I think it really is, once you've decided that you want a pup, uh, you got one, you have livestock. I mean, everybody that that's probably listening has livestock. That's why they're listening in. Uh, so they have a certain amount of savvy. But honestly, there there's a lot to learn. You know, other than just moving stock around. Like for me, it was a big eye opener to realize what these dogs can do. But it also opened my eyes at I didn't know, really know how to work livestock that well. And I mean, I'm always always trying to learn. If there is another way, and but the way I look at it is livestock, they have feelings, you know, they have expressions. When you walk to an animal, they have a feel. Either they're afraid of you, they're, um, they're not afraid of you, they're, they're afraid of certain motions, you know, lifting your hands or, you know, just the way you walk, like I'm, I, I think that's really important to know mm. the feel between you and your livestock. Because if you know where to position yourself to get the job done in the easiest way possible, then you can train your dog to do that. But if you don't know where to be, even though you, you think you might, these border collies that I've trained that are, have great natural ability and readability, They've trained me to see the intricacies of all this. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've kind of placed my dog in a certain position because I thought that's where you need to be to get the job done. And they're telling me, look, that, that's not the right spot. You need, I, I need to be here to get this job done. You do want me to do the job, don't you, and get this done? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm telling you, you should do it this way. And my dog's going, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, uh, you know, that, that really is against the grain. I should be here. And then at the end of the day, I realized, you know what? The sheep are really telling me that they wanted to be here or this certain area. And my dog was reading it right. So he was right. So, like you said, the dogs really taught me a lot. And I mean, I never learned this all by myself either. There's plenty of people, plenty of conditions clinicians that I've been to that I can say thank you to for helping show and you know me a way of trying to read this but all it is is just being able to read your livestock to know what they're thinking before they do it and also maybe not really that but watching movements and realizing that you need to react to it you know because they're giving you signs whether it's an ear their head turns, you know, whatever, sheep stomp their feet, like they all have different expressions and different things. So being able to read those, it, oh man, when you've been drugged through the mud enough, you start to realize that, you know, when a mama cow paws, you know, the ground and she's shaking her head and looking at you, you kind of, after you've been in enough wrecks, not that I've been in a lot of wrecks, I'm sure kind of chicken, 
but I picked up on a lot of these things. And you realize, like, you can only do so much. You have limitations. I have limitations. Dogs have limitations. So assessing the situation, what is the easiest way to get past this issue or problem to get the job done, man, all you have to do is just own livestock and you can feel all that frustration and pressure and, and situations that you have to work through to get the job done. And, and uh, as frustrating as it can be, um, once you realize, you know, that it's easier to work with them than fight them, you know, a lot of times, or to take a different avenue, a different direction, a different way of going about it, um, it can just make your life a lot easier too. So the ability to read your livestock, um, kind of talked about that. Another thing that that's probably helped me a lot, um, it's pretty simple kind of concept. I often ask myself the question like, my my sheep won't get into this pen. I can't get them off of this field. I can't get them into this area, uh, and the, and they're fighting. I ask myself, what can I do? Like, what can I do to get this job done in the easiest way possible? And sometimes it might be the next day or the day after or next week. Or it could be a month or two down the road that I finally come up with a good idea. Think oh, I should have tried that. Um, but I don't know, I'm just getting off way off on a tangent here, so apologize that that just doesn't kind of yeah, not getting anywhere with that. Anyways, um, another thing I wanted to touch on um, besides the importance of stockmanship was pressure and release. I use the method. I've been around a lot of horse trainers. Um, I like to use just simple, basic, apply some pressure until you get a step in the right direction, you know, a little bit of a hint of what you want, and then release. In all different forms, whether it's a cord, whether it's body pressure, um, like any form of pressure, right? You add the pressure onto something. And you're looking for a step in the right direction and then release the pressure. So using body pressure when I'm training my dogs, I get myself in a certain position. I try to put a certain amount of pressure, as light a pressure as possible. Now, all of a sudden, I'm looking at my dog and my livestock to figure out, okay, what do I need to do? Do I need to step forward or step back? And whenever I see a little glimmer in the right direction, I release. I think that it, it's almost impossible to train a stock dog, in my opinion, if you don't have a little bit of a feel to that. I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? Because <laughs> I'm out. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I can let you know if any do come in. All right. Well, I guess on the next webinar, hopefully that materializes better than this one. Uh, the next one will be on starting your stock dog. Does that uh, sound all right, Ashley, or what? Uh, yeah, so the next one um, for the part two is going to be next week. It's uh, next Tuesday, June 28th, um, 7 p.m. start time, just like it was tonight. Um, and Ken, I did see we do have a question that came through. There's a couple now. Uh, so the first one is when training dogs, do you change your approach or technique depending on having a strong eyed or looser eyed dog? Okay. Strong eyed dogs. In the beginning, I didn't know much about. Them. Well, actually, that's a, that's, that's a complete lie. My first dog that I ever had named Jade, had a lot of eye, tremendous amount of eye, all sorts of want to work too, and no bite. For instance, she'd get around the sheep, both directions. She'd go right between a fence, you know, and the sheep, and it didn't, didn't, it didn't bother at all. But she would get there and then just eye up. 
Just watch the stock. That's frustrating. If you're trying to get a job done and they're just flanked around something and it's stopped, some of that has a lot to do with just confidence in the dog's, you know, demeanor, confidence and natural power. But it was not effective for me when I had sheep that didn't really want to move. Um, so working dogs with more eye doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, maybe portraying that, but that they're weak because that's not true. Um, but that eye can lock up and make them not want to move, even though they have confidence. I like to break them loose. Um, so training a dog with more eye, I keep them moving more. I don't let them lock up into a position and sit there and watch. I'll, I'll either be shifting them left or right or, or something. I'll, I'll also use a cord if need be. I'll just pick up the cord and make them move their feet. I'll just ask them whatever it is that I want, whether it's the flank or the walk up or, or the recall, whatever it is, I won't allow them to lock up. Even though it's a natural tendency for them to be like that. Um, and the loose side dog. Um, the loose side dog has a tendency to want to flank from left to right predominantly, not always. But a loose side dog usually doesn't focus on the stock as intently. You know, that type of dog, uh, I favor. <laughs> If I had my choice between a strong-eyed dog and a loose-eyed dog, I'd probably pick the looser-eyed dog every time. Even though it, they're, the loose-eyed dog can do too much flanking and not enough walking forward in a straight line, uh, and that's just a general view of, you know, of, of a loose-eyed dog. But I like dogs that naturally want to step into the zone easier, step forward easier. And a loose eyed dog, because of his eye, allows them genetically just to walk forward and stay closer or up into their stock more. Um, but how do I train one over the other? I just keep that little bugger to where he doesn't lock up. I don't allow him to. I know it genetically it's in there. I know that naturally it's in there. So the one dog I'm trying to tighten up and teach him to walk straight hold the line and and hold himself back and the other one I'm just allowing to be more natural or I'm expecting him to step when I ask him to step and and breaking breaking him loose I guess so to speak is maybe the term I could use but also I can let that dog go a lot more in some ways because he's more natural a dog with more eye has a tendency to be more, and this is just a general, general, you know, statement. So it's not like for all of them, but I, I really believe that you can kind of let things, I don't know. No, that's not the right term that it slides, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm answering that quite right either, but the loose eye dog, I just, I try and teach them. I hold them back. I, I help them more in certain positions, certain ways. Um, but, man, the mix between the two is perfect. If I had my choice, I'd, I'd have that one right in the middle. It's not too loose and not too strong. I take it every time. And the next question that there is, is do you have any tips for herding ewes with young lambs? Oh, the tips for working use with young lambs. Mm. Be patient. Give that you with her lamb some time to pick up her lamb and walk away. Don't add too much pressure because if you do, she's going to fight to the death for her to fight well maybe not fight to that that's an extreme but i mean if she's any kind of you that wants to protect her lamb she's going to protect her lamb so adding a little bit of pressure smooth steady quiet pressure 
is the most effective on cows and calves, on ewes. But if that ewe comes out to meet the dog, my dog's allowed to do his job. If he needs to bite her on the nose and turn her, I expect him to do it and I allow him to do it. But no more than that. As soon as that ewe has turned, I stop my dogs and I release the pressure off the ewe and allow her to pick up her lamb and leave. So that's how I would kind of explain it in a nutshell. Okay. Then I just, it's not so much a question, more of just um, a comment. Uh, it says, I went through a similar herding instinct with my dog. She would be on the wrong side of the sheep as we headed back to the pen. I was always trying to move her back to the proper side. I have learned that she was right in reading the sheep. I had to learn. Look forward to more of your insight. Yeah, she's lots to learn. <laughs> <laughs> And every situation is different. It's very difficult to try and explain this, like, just like on a podcast. It, it really would, I mean, it's, it's damn near impossible almost. So, but yeah, it's reading livestock, what they do, how they react. It's, it's, it's everything. I have to see it. I have to see it, see how your dog reacts. And then I can, you know, make an assessment, decide like, is it because my dog's afraid? Is it because my dog's too aggressive? Is it because, you know, my sheep are too aggressive towards my dog? Uh, is it because my sheep are too afraid of me? Is it because, you know, I'm too loud? Is it because I'm not bold enough? Is it because I'm too bold? You know, like, there's, I mean, you name it, there's a million things that it could be. And being able to stand as a bystander and just look at people working their dogs, a lot of times, you can kind of see why things are happening that way. Not always, but at least you can kind of assess, like, is, is your dog, you know, uh, too aggressive or is he too afraid? You know, okay, well, then it's pretty easy to pick something and say, okay, well, if he's afraid, I'm just going to go over and give him a pat on the head and say, hey, little buddy, you're okay. You're doing good. Yeah, I'm, I'm here with you. Don't worry. Uh, we'll do this together. I'm here to help you. I want to be on his side, right? And if it's the maybe the other way around, my dog's too aggressive. I'm going to go like, Hey, 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 take it easy. I don't think that was really necessary. Was it like tone it down just a little bit? I like what you're doing. Don't get me wrong, but let's try and just mold it and shape it a little bit more the way I want it. You know, which is like not attacking the sheep every second. Right. And there's another question that came in. It says, how would you help a dog who has mainly done driving work at the back end of large herds and help them start flanking and finding balance on smaller herds or groups of stock? So she's working a big flock, I take it. If she's wanting to work a big flock. She's wanting flanks left and right and driving. Is that correct? Yeah, so I'll just... I'll read it one more time. How would you help a dog who has mainly done driving work at the back end of large herds and help them start flanking and finding balance on smaller herds or groups of stock? Okay. Okay. So like for me, it's like completely ass backwards, really. Like I don't, I don't take a dog out and start driving with it for, for a long periods of time. Like when you're working big groups of sheep and that's all you do and that's all you've ever trained the dog to do. Um, yeah, it's pretty difficult by that point to start teaching it to want to get around if it's trained not to. So I always start in a small area, like I said, where I allow my pups right from day one to get around their sheep, to circle, to gather, to get around to balance. So it's an older dog. It's obviously got some training. I would go back to a small area. I would take a small group of sheep and I would allow my dog or encourage my dog, let's say, to get to the other side of the sheep. And when it does get to the other side of sheep and show the dog that I want the dog to balance the sheep to me, opposed to staying with me and driving the sheep away. So to ask for those flanks on the drive at this point in your training, um, I mean, it, it's just kind of backwards of the way I would do it. I would, I would have my dog already out running, balancing, at least balancing the sheep towards me before I ever start driving with my dogs, you know, 
and bigger groups. I work on a small group and then work to a bigger group. Uh, so it just, it, it takes time to get a dog trained to a point where you can expect more, but then there's a big advantage. Once I get to the point where my dog will get around the sheet both directions and balance the sheet to me, and it can do that feeling comfortable doing that job, the next job would be driving, pushing stock away from me. And it's, it's ass backwards for them. They're going like, well, this makes no sense. You've, you've taught me to go to the head and bring stock to you, and now you're telling me to drive them away? Man, have you gone mad? Like, you, I mean, like, get with your, like, what's your program anyways? Cause you're confusing me. And it's like, no, it's two different jobs, dog. Like that's outrun balance fetch. And then this is like, push the stock away. Oh, okay. And then pretty soon they, they get comfortable doing fetching balance work. And then they get comfortable driving and pushing, uh, but it takes time. So if you've had a dog that you're already driving and you've already been driving stock, you know, bigger groups farther away, um, I would just go back to a smaller area and try and see if I can develop that balance in my dog, meaning get to the other side of the stock and bring them to me. I hope that answers. hope I wasn't too rough. Uh, and there's another question. It says, uh, oh, hang on here. There's more coming in. Any tips or tricks to teach a dog to nip heels to help move stock instead of trying to go to the head all the time? On large herds or even stock that sticks their head in a corner, it would be handy to have an alternative for a persuasion. Well, I think it kind of explained it already in the last one, it, but kind of opposite. So, um, so she wants to learn how to teach a dog to drive instead of going to the head, right? That's I believe so. What the, so. Probably the easiest fix for that is put a hundred foot cord on your dog and just hold the cord. If your dog goes to the head, just call its name or a recall, whatever you use here. Every time the dog tries to run off to the head, just say here and just tug the cord. As the dog comes back to you, say there, walk up and just each keep, keep showing the dog, knowing you can't run to the head. It can't allow to go to the head because it's got a cord on it. It's allowed to work within your area on 100 feet of cord, and I just let the cord kind of drag through through my hand, you know, as I was doing it. Um, that would probably be the thing that I would do to, to deal with that. Okay, and the next question is, any ideas how to keep dogs busy during slow times uh, or in the winter? <laughs> you can watch TV, probably enjoys that. I do. <laughs> I, I, see, there's just so many things you can do if you wanted i mean shoot dogs love being outside my dogs love the winter they you know whatever you do with them whether it's taking for a quad ride or a horse ride or heck i don't know anything anything that you want to do anything outdoor activities that you want to do you know i remember one year my daughter was driving the skidoo and uh <laughs> the dog that i had at the time it was had both feet on the handlebars of the skidoo and like was sitting in her lap. Like, I don't know. I, I got a horse walker at home too. Here's another thing that she would do. She'd pop this dog up into this little kind of like a hammock that was hooked between the two uh, tie outs on, on the walker, on the revolving walker. And she just pop the dog up into that. And it was, she turned the walker on the dogs, just like sitting in that walker as she's going merry-go-round. It's like, damn, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's silly what you can do. You can, you know, just use your imagination. There's a million things you can do with your dog to keep them active. Uh, ski joring, shoot, there's, I don't know. What, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how would you help an older dog that is works tightly with the group to go out wider in his circles or sides when working in a large flock on pasture? Okay, that, that stems right back to being small and working big again. Uh, I mean, you put a back command or a get out or, or your whistle that means open up, you know, on a flank. Um, it's about being in a good position 
establishing the foundation of what that word means to bend or to move off their stock, show them how to do it by being in a good position, being consistent, show them what it is exactly what you want. When you get a give in the right direction one time, the way you want, you release, you pressure and release, and it's just chipping away until all of a sudden it becomes a really smooth, easy habit. And every dog is different. How important is it to this person to, you know, get this? Is it the dog's genetics that it just makes it difficult for you to train them because it feels so right to the dog? And then you're trying to change that? It can be more difficult. So certain breeds, certain or certain strains, you know, uh, my own dogs, you know, can run tight. They they do. Uh, sometimes they run tight. I just keep showing them, keep showing them what I want. You know, I'll stop them on on uh, wherever he's wrong. I'll stop him. I'll get into a position and I'll influence what I want, how I want it, and I'll keep showing them until it becomes habitual. Until all of a sudden, he just gets comfortable and realizes what I want and that he has to do it, whether it's against his grain or not. I, uh, I'm going to just keep working at it and keep showing them. And some dogs pick it up easy and others don't. Some things I can live with because it really doesn't affect the stock. If I feel like it doesn't affect my livestock and it's just because I want it, well, to me, that's senseless. I, like, I have to do it for a reason because it affects the way my stock is being worked. Hope that answers the question too. There is a follow-up. So it's the original poster of that last question. They put to follow mm -hmm. up with my question. It's a collie that was used indoors and auction mart clearing pens for a few years where he learned to work close. Now he is struggling to get wider circles working in the pasture. Right. Go small, work in a smaller, like you can, you can work, uh, you know, in a big field on some really well, you know, quiet views that aren't going to run off the field because it doesn't do you much good if your sheep run off the field. So as long as you can get your livestock that you're working in a big area and you can control them and you can stay close to your livestock, you can influence your dog to have some bend, have some, you know, moving off the stock, getting outside, you know, on the edge of that flight zone, you know, and start small, chip away at it, you know, keep showing them. Um, well, I'm just kind of looking at the time here and we're a little past um, the time. So uh, with that being said, um, Ken, I'd like to thank you and to all of the participants who joined us this evening. As I previously mentioned, um, there is a second part to this webinar with Ken taking place next Tuesday, June 28th at 7 p.m. Um, I will be sending out an email to everybody who registered for this evening session that will include a link to where you can access this webinar recording. So once again, thank you very much, Ken, for, for presenting to our producers this evening. Um, I'm sure they've learned a lot. I know that I, I certainly have. Well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, I, I feel like you can do a lot better. I, I was pretty nervous in the beginning, so.